speaking. We come with the heart of praise. We come just seeking you this morning for all that you are. We're so thankful, Lord, for who you are this season that, that you came. You came to be as one of us, to walk with us, and to be our Redeemer, Lord. And we're so thankful for you. We're thankful for all that you provided. We love you and we praise you. And all God's people... Good morning. I tell you, it's, uh, if you uh, are not from Georgia, I just want to encourage you, if you don't like the weather today, then wait till tomorrow. Last week, when we were in here on Sunday, we were freezing because the heat wasn't working. And today, the air's not working. But God is God no matter what the weather, amen? So we were, we were kind of talking earlier in the, in the back room and came up with a, a little, kind of a little song. We didn't really actually call it a song, but it's like a little discomfort for the Lord. A little discomfort for the Lord. That's all I got out of it. But, but the good thing is, is that no matter what we feel on the outside, you know, sometimes, you know, when you really put things into perspective, there's a lot of places that meet in a lot worse conditions than we can even imagine. But they come because they come to be one with another, to fellowship with one another, and then to glorify the name of Jesus. So we're thankful this morning that we have a place to come. And we are working with the, uh, with the school. They're, they're working diligently to get all this repaired and fixed. But till that happens, we'll be here doing whatever God calls us to do. Amen? Amen. If you have a bulletin, you can stand with me. If you, if you didn't get a bulletin this morning, feel free. We have our scripture reading on the, on the screen this morning. If you all will stand with us together. And we'll read our scripture reading together this morning. We'll be reading from 1 John chapter 5, verses 18 through 20. Let's begin. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true. In His Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We can dismiss our children this morning for Children's Church. And you're welcome to keep her if you want in here, whatever y'all prefer to do. We have an age about her age, so she's welcome to go. It's really whatever y'all choose to do. So if you have your Bibles, if you'll open up and... Um, in the Gospel of John, we're going to be in chapter 18 this morning. John chapter 18. And we'll continue in our study. We're getting closer to the end of this Gospel. And what a beautiful study we've had. Just seeing all that God is doing and all that He's, um, he's done through the Gospel of John. It's just a wonderful book. Particularly, I recommend this book for, for new believers. Um, I, I think it's just a, it just really gives us the, the true insight of who Jesus is and what, what God did uh, for us in this book. But recapping last week, we saw the closing prayer, or the benediction, as we call it, of Jesus praying over his disciples and then praying over all believers, which includes us. We know that this is the last time he will be spending alone with them before he goes to Gethsemane. And there he will be taken away. Jesus knows he's in the Father's will, and we know that whatever he asks of the Father will be granted to him. And all he asks is that through him, first, the Father will be glorified, and in him all of those that the Father have given to him would be protected from the evil one that's in this world, and that none would be lost. And Jesus knows that his time of suffering is at hand, but he also knows that soon he will be seated again at the right hand of the Father just as he was in the beginning before the foundation of the world. And we took note that to be one with Christ as he is, on, is one with the Father, we have to come to the end of ourselves. Less of us and more of him. And Jesus gave us this example of what this looks like. We, we made the statement last week that God can't be fully God in us until we're empty of ourselves. And I wanted to make note again, God is always fully God. But until we're empty of ourselves, He can't be fully God in us to do His full will through us because we tend to want to get in the way. Jesus lived this example out. 
And only in Him can we take up our cross daily and follow Him. When Jesus prayed, He didn't pray that we would be removed from this world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. So we shouldn't try to hide away from the world. Uh, as we talked about last week, there are some who, who feel that they need to just kind of be, protect themselves from every aspect. So they hide in their rooms and they hide in their homes and, and they only work, they only do this, they don't go out. And that's really not what God intended for believers. He left us here for two purposes. One, to be a light to the world. You can't be a light to the world if you're hid away. And two, to be an encouragement to one another as believers. And that's the purpose of the church, that we come together to encourage one another. And we need to shine the light of Jesus in the world so that the darkness is exposed and He, being the light of the world, is revealed to all who will hear. So this week we begin John chapter 18. Our title this week is The Inquisition. The Inquisition. Father, we ask that you would open our hearts and open our minds to hear your word, that you would give us wisdom, you would encourage us, that we would grow closer and closer to you, and that your word would penetrate our hearts to go with us day in and day out as we move forward. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all might need to turn this down just a hair. John 18, starting with verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew this place. For Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again, Whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let those go their way, that, they may say, that the saying might be fulfilled, which he spoke, Of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. Verse 10, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Then the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him, and they led him away to Annas. First, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. So now Jesus is beginning his final chapter of ministry here on earth. He's now spent all the times with the disciples. He's now been separated from the disciples here at the garden. They're, they're going to be taking him and taking him away. And his entire existence on this earth has purposely led him to this place. He's poured his life into the disciples and he's protected them and he's prayed for them. But now it's time for him to leave them. And on a side note, Judas has also filled his destiny, leading the soldiers to where he knew Jesus would be. Now John's Gospel doesn't give us a full account of Judas and, and the betrayal, but in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all tell of how Judas betrayed Jesus, Jesus with a kiss. And Mark's Gospel tells us that this was a signal to the soldiers that the one he would kiss is Jesus. And we know that after the fact, Judas did have remorse for his actions. And I can't help but wonder if it was at this point of the kiss, when he kissed Jesus, that it hit him what he'd actually done. We don't know when it actually took him as far as the remorse, but we know that, that he became remorseful. And in Luke 22:48, we hear Jesus when he said, Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? And I'm sure that those words penetrated his heart. They must have haunted him and ultimately drove him to hang himself. And some have asked if in his remorse did he actually repent and believe. I'm going to have to say from everything that I've read and everything that I've studied, nothing gives us any indication of repentance. There was remorse. 
But remorse can't save you. Remorse can't save anyone. Now, not asking for a show of hand in, hands in our lives, but how many of us, of us have done things in our lives that we're remorseful for, that we wish we hadn't have done? But outside of Jesus and coming to Him and repentance and then asking forgiveness, the remorse is not enough. It's just feeling bad. And most of the time, it's feeling bad because you got caught. Nine times out of ten, that's where most remorse is for people who are not seeking repentance. We have remorse for those things, but only confessing our sin and repenting and asking for forgiveness is their salvation. I believe that Judas could have fallen at Jesus' feet. He could have asked for forgiveness. And I believe Jesus would have forgiven him. But there's no record that that happened. Matthew 27, 4 through 5 says, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. This is Judas talking to the, to the Pharisees. And they said, What is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. He recognized he had sinned, and in his remorse he took back the 30 pieces of silver, but then he went out and hanged himself. And I believe that this is not an act of a man who's been forgiven, but more of an act who's over, of a man who's overwhelmed with guilt and acted out of condemnation, not forgiveness. Now back to our text. Jesus asked the soldiers, Whom are you seeking? And they answered, Jesus of Nazareth. And upon his answer, they drew back and fell to the ground. He said these simple words, I am he. And there's power in these words. God is the great I am. And Jesus here is proclaiming that he too is the great I am. God told Moses back in Exodus, in verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 5, he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off of your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. It was God's presence that made the, God whole, uh, the ground holy. It wasn't the ground itself. It was God's presence. And Moses dared not approach God in a casual manner. And here, while Jesus was willing to go with the soldiers, and I want you to hear this point, he was willing to go with the soldiers. This statement to them was powerful, powerful because he's saying, I am the great I am. And by knocking them down with only his words, it makes this statement that it's not in your power that I go, but it's rather I choose to go. And I believe that's something that we really need to grasp here. They had no power over Jesus. Jesus was in complete control because Jesus was where he was supposed to be at the will of the Father. In John 19, we'll get to that uh, uh, in our next uh, study, but Jesus makes this point to Pilate because Pilate asked him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? And Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Jesus knew why he was there. And he knew that these men had no power. And personally, I kind of believe that after these guys picked themselves back up off the ground, they were a little bit less confident than they were when they first arrived. Because they didn't know what happened. I am he. Bam! Uh, you're looking at one another. Did you trip over something? No, I didn't. Did you? Well, why are we on the ground? I don't know. But they stood back up and they moved forward. Jesus asked again who they're seeking. And he asked that they release the disciples in accordance with his prayer earlier. And we read that in chapter 17, that none of them who were given to him would be lost. Peter, however, tries once again to handle things in the flesh. You know Peter, he's always stepping forward and then having to step back. He cut off the ear of the high priest's servant. Now Luke's account tells us that Jesus healed the servant by touching his ear, which shows us that even upon those who came to take Jesus, he still had compassion. He had compassion on all men. And this would be Peter's last bold fleshly move. And Jesus made it clear to him and to all those present that he will finish what God sent him to do and that he would take and drink of the cup that the Father has given him because it's the Father's plan. It's the Father's will that he be there for this particular time at this particular day. So at this point, they took Jesus and all the disciples scattered just as Jesus told them they would do Back in John chapter 16, verse 32, he said, Indeed, the hour is coming 
Yes, it's now come that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. Also remember Jesus said, but I am not alone because the Father is with me. The Father never left him there. And so the Inquisition begins. We find Jesus first in the hands of Annas, who is the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the current high priest. So beginning with verse 14 in John chapter 18. Now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and went with Jesus to the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door outside. Then the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. Then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, You are not also one of these men's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. Now the servants and officers who had come made a fire of coals and stood there, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself. And the high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet. And in secret I have said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I have said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. And when he, struck, he said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Do you answer the high priest like that? Now Jesus answered him, If I've spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. Therefore they said to him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. And one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him whose ear Peter cut off, said, Did I not see you in the garden with him? And Peter then denied again, and immediately a rooster crowed. Now I want to take note here in one particular part of this passage. At first glance, it may appear that there's a discrepancy regarding who the high priest was. Annas was formerly the high priest. And it's kind of like our officials here in this country, if you will. When you're a president of the United States, when you have now fulfilled your term, you're still referred to as President so-and-so. President Carter, President Bush, President Clinton, so on and so forth. So after, their, after this, uh, Annas had been removed from the office or stepped down, Caiaphas then took over as high priest, but he still held the title of high priest. So when they asked him, why do you answer the high priest like that, they were referring more out of respect to the title that he formerly had, but he was not the current high priest. That was Caiaphas. He held that position. And after Annas had done his questioning and had his part of the Inquisition, he was then taken to Caiaphas. And we see Peter, another disciple, along with another disciple, following cautiously. They're kind of watching at a distance and seeing what's going on. And Peter warned himself at the fire. And here we see Peter's denial of Jesus, just as Jesus prophesied in John chapter 13, 37 through 38. Peter had said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. And Jesus answered him, Will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly I say to you, the rooster shall not crow. You have denied me three times. I want to look at Matthew's account of Peter's denial as well. Matthew uh, chapter 26, verse 75, and it says, And Peter remembered the word of Jesus who had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. Now one could take this passage about Peter and compare it to Judas and say, Well, wait a minute. Aren't there similar situations here? They're both remorseful. He was filled with remorse, so what's the difference between the two? But unlike Judas, Peter saw from remorse was, and all of his guilt was turned to repentance. And in that repentance, Jesus also brought him restoration, as we see in chapter 21, that Jesus restores Peter. Judas died in his fleshly guilt, but Peter lived and restored because of his humility and faith to Jesus to forgive. This is so important for all of us. It's so important for us as believers to see it's not enough just to be sorry. It's not enough just to be sorry. 
we have to humble ourselves before the Lord and recognize that it's only in Him that our guilt can be taken away and only in Him can He forgive and restore us. It's so important to grasp that. It's so important to understand that. You can see patterns in the world today. You can particularly see it in battered women's lives and in homes where the husband is abusive. He can be very remorseful five minutes after it happened. Or maybe after, if it's an alcoholic situation, after he's sober, oh, I'll never do that again. I'm so sorry. But then it happens again. And it happens again. Remorse and sorry doesn't change the heart. All it does is bring a little emotion that most of the time within itself fades away and you circle right back into that same pattern again. We have to take that remorse and take the feeling of the remorse and lay that at Jesus' feet and say, yes, I'm remorseful, yes, I'm sorry, but God, I need more than that. I need less of me and more of you. I need you to take this. I need you to change my heart so that this pattern is broken in me and I'm no longer bound by the sin that grasps my heart. I'm no longer bound by this pattern. And let me tell you something. God is a pattern breaker. He's a habit breaker. And He can do that in any life who is submissive to Him to come to Him and say, Lord, I have this issue. I don't want it anymore. And I recognize in my pride and in my selfishness I've held on to this one area of my heart. And we discussed this a couple of weeks ago. Each one of us have chambers of our hearts that God has been knocking on. Yes, we're saved. Yes, we believe. We've accepted Jesus Christ. I pray everyone in here has. If you've not, then this is the time. Today is the day of salvation to receive Jesus Christ into your heart and into your life. But for those who have, sometimes we still keep those hidden areas tucked away. It's like, I give you everything, Lord. Except that. Because that's too difficult to deal with. Or maybe our flesh just likes it too much. Whatever it may be, He wants that. He wants every aspect of that so that He can forgive, He can restore, and we can move forward out of the previous patterns and the habits and grow in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's who we're called to be. Amen? Amen. Amen. Verses 28 through 40. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. And it was early morning that they themselves did not go into the praetorium lest they should be defiled but that they might eat the Passover. Pilate then went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not an evildoer, would we have not delivered him up to you? Then Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this? Or did others tell you this concerning me? And Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priest have delivered you to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? And Jesus answered, You, are rightly, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all, but you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Then they all cried again, saying, No, not this man, but Barabbas. And Barabbas was a robber. He was also a murderer, as we have read in other, uh, some of the other uh, Gospels. So from Annas to Caiaphas, and now to Pilate, Jesus, being the Lamb of God, is being led to the slaughter. This is the moment that the Jews have been waiting for. They've been plotting this ever since Jesus came onto the scene. If they had their way, Jesus would have been killed a long time ago. And remember, they took up stones a couple of times to stone him, but he disappeared into the crowd. 
and they've got him right where they want him. Or do they? Actually, Jesus has himself right where he wants to be because this is where the Father wants him. I don't know if any of you have ever played the game of chess. I like to play the game of chess. I'm not very good at it. But I like to play. I like to play somebody that's equally good but not better than me. You know, right. chess is one of those games when you play somebody really good, you don't have a chance. And the reason why is because they know the game so well, they're usually one step ahead of you on every move. The very first move that they move, they're anticipating what you're going to do in response. And they have the exact plan on every move that you make all the way down. He's pre-calculated his moves to every point is exactly what he wanted you to do. And you thought you were in control the whole time. And I can't tell you how many times I've taken my off that queen. I thought, oh man, this is a perfect move. One more move and I'll have them in check. And as soon as I make that move, whoop, he takes my queen. I didn't see that. How did that happen? But the point here is it's all pre-calculated. It's all done. He knew pretty much ahead what you're going to do. You were never in control at all. And in the same way, God has pre-calculated everything and every scene that would bring Jesus to this very place at this very hour. Everyone was in place for that very thing. And the Jews really had no clue. Even Caiaphas prophesied earlier in John 11:50. He said, Nor do you consider that it's expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that one would die for the whole, or the whole nation should perish? He had no clue what he was truly saying. He didn't, this was words that came out of his mouth, but he didn't understand the full meaning. But Jesus, while bound and tried in this mock court, he knew exactly who he was and he knew exactly why he was there. And as I said earlier, he chose to be there. He chose to be there. It's funny to me that the Jews are being so bold and several times in the past, as I said earlier, they've taken up stones to stone Jesus. But here they say, oh, it's unlawful for us to put anyone to death. Talk about flip-flopping. When it's convenient to them, when it was in a place, not during the, uh, the Passover, when it was all in a situation where they wanted to be, they had no problem putting a man to death. And on top of that, they even plotted to put down, um, I'm sorry, went right on my head. Thank you, Lazarus. Because he too is now a witness. And so they plotted to take Lazarus. And so the funny thing is, is that they are willing to take a life when it's convenient for them. But here, they don't, it's not legal. It's unlawful for us to put anyone to death. And I believe there's a couple of reasons for this change of heart. Number one, they're hiding behind the Roman authority. They're hiding behind the Roman soldiers. It, it is the Passover, so they don't want to be defiled, and they want to have themselves be able to go and eat and celebrate at the Passover. Now, these men were experts at rationalization. They could take any point and rationalize it to their benefit. They wanted this man dead, even though he really didn't do anything wrong. But they, in their fear of losing their power and control, they just wanted him gone. They committed murder in their hearts because Jesus said, if you're angry at your brother, to hate your brother, then you committed murder in your hearts. But since they have the Roman rule, they can use them to do the dirty work and then appear, appear to be guiltless of any transaction. And that's what they were trying to do. Now, second point is it was prophesied that Jesus would be crucified so as we pointed out earlier, everything the Jews did while they thought they were in control was done by the hand of God to accomplish his plan, to bring everything into completion. So now Jesus is standing before Pilate, and Pilate is now questioning him. And he asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Now Jesus' response is interesting. He answers the question first with a question. Are you asking this of yourself, or did others say this about me? I believe this is an important thought for us to comprehend why Jesus does this. If you remember, all through his ministry, he would ask very plain questions that he already knew the answers to, but he wanted someone to say it out loud. He wanted someone to give the answer for whatever purpose for themselves. And I believe that's what was happening here because I believe he was trying to bring all parties into accountability. Because each party on this, in this scene here, the Pharisees on one side and Pilate on the other, both were using the other for life, so they didn't want to be accountable for what was going on. Nobody wanted to be accountable for why Jesus was there. And Pilate says, well, and I'm not a Jew. It was your people who brought you to me. And so now he's putting everything back over on the Jews. And as we saw earlier, they're using him. So they're not accountable. 
But the truth is, is they're all accountable. They're all accountable for this event. But let me say, not only them, each one born into this world is accountable for the death of Jesus because each one of us is born into sin. And it's your sin, and it's my sin, and it's the Pharisees, it's the scribes, it's the, it's the Roman soldiers. It's all of our sin that Jesus came to redeem us from. It was everyone. So while we personally didn't, didn't physically lead him to the cross, and neither you nor I physically hammered those nails into his feet and his hands, our sin makes us just as accountable as the Jewish leaders and the Roman soldiers and Pilate himself. Jesus said back in verse 37, For this cause I was born, and for this cause I've come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. The Pilate then comes and says, What is truth? Now I don't know for sure, and this is some speculation, so bear with me on this, but this question to Pilate leads me to believe, uh, or actually the question that Pilate says, What is truth? leads me to believe that Pilate is a student of philosophy more than anything else, and one who doesn't believe in absolutes. And today we can hear that same question that penetrates our culture. What is truth? And with relativism being so prominent in our country and in our world today, truth is whatever you want it to be. Is it relative to me? Am I hurting anyone else? Am I being happy? Is this good for me? They don't look at God's absolutes because they don't want to apply absolutes of God in their life because that puts boundaries. But without God, there's no boundary, so therefore I can be my own God. Or I can do whatever I want to do and worship however I want to worship. And, and I believe that Pilate was in that same kind of mindset. You know, do whatever you want to do. Be whoever you want to be. And notice Pilate after that, he goes and he says, I find no fault in Jesus. Now up to this point, I believe that Pilate is saying that if Jesus believes what he believes and he teaches what he teaches, so be it. No skin off my back. I don't care what he does or what he does. He's not hurting anybody. I kind of think this was his mindset. And Pilate could have let him go just as easily as he had him crucified with no concern either way. Pilate wasn't a man of principle or conviction, but rather a man of convenience. He was a man of convenience. He also didn't care what the Jews believed. But they were creating such a scene and it was more convenient to let them have their way than to let Jesus go. Now, when we do get to chapter 19, we'll see in the next chapter that when the Jews say he claimed to be the Son of God, there seems to be a little fear going on with Pilate at that point. Now, he's dealing with something just a little bit different. Maybe it's penetrated his heart more because it does talk about a little bit of fear. But I believe to this point, he doesn't even want to be bothered with it. But he's going to take the easy way out. This crowd's loud, screaming louder. Let's take their thing and let's go on and move on about it. Jesus did declare himself the Son of God. But in all of this, every player in this scene was placed there by God to bring about this plan of salvation. And Jesus told Pilate that if his kingdom was of this world, then his followers would fight for him. They would take up arms. They would come and fight in his defense. And he could have brought down legions of angels. He had that power and authority. He could have brought down angels to take him and to deliver him to persecute all of those who brought persecution against him to bring everyone down into judgment and into submission. Satan even understood that concept because when he tempted Jesus in the desert in Matthew chapter 4 verse 6, he said, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you and their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. So the scriptures say that the angels would come at his beck and call but Jesus didn't call. He didn't call the angels down. It was within his power to do just that. But that would only bring judgment into the world on everyone and there would be no redemption. There's no redemption without the shed of blood. Uh, of blood. There's no redemption without Jesus dying on the cross. Each of us would still be slaves to sin and death. He had to finish what God sent him to do. And this is the true heart of the Christmas season. It's the true heart of coming into the new year. You know, as we get ready to celebrate the new year this next week, many of you here, I personally don't do it anymore. I gave up on resolutions when I gave up on the last one, probably at about age five or six. Because we all make these resolutions, oh, this year, 
and this year I'm going to do this, and they sit in our goal, and by March or April, it's gone. It's out of our hearts. It's out of our minds. And particularly if it had to do with physical exercise. Because once you do it, those muscles hurt, and you decide, that's really what I was counting on. I don't want to do that anymore. And, you know, personally, with, with the illness I went through here uh, about a month or so ago, I had to quit running. And I just started back this week. And I said to myself, what was I thinking? I never really enjoyed this anyway, did I? But I'm back at it because I have to be. It's just part of who I am. God is just kind of... I really do feel that in that time I worship, I pray, and I'm able to be closer to God when I run. But it's just something that it, it's not easy to get back into. It's painful. And resolutions are that way. So let me just leave you with this this morning as we come into this next year. Don't make the resolutions of what you're going to do in your flesh. Don't make the resolutions about your weight, about your diet, about whatever habit it might be. If we approach life with resolutions built in the flesh, then there will be failure after failure after failure after failure. But if we approach this next year with resolution in our heart, that there will be more of Jesus and less of ourselves, and that we spend more time in the Word, and we discipline ourselves to read and to study and to have that prayer time, and then also that we find that fellowship that God's brought us to, and we come and we fellowship and we encourage one another, and we understand that when we come to church together, we're not coming to get something. We're coming to give. And in that heart of giving is when you receive. Because when you come with an attitude of humility and willing to reach out to your brother and sister to bring encouragement, to bring mission or ministry to them in, in whatever way it might be, each one of us is a minister of Jesus Christ. And each one of you has a gift. Each one of you has a talent. And whatever that is, as you come together and you fellowship with one another, then he wants to use that to encourage one another. He wants to use the word in you to encourage another believer. And so when we approach coming to fellowship that way and not about the music and not about how loud it can be and not about how beautiful everything is. and I mean, God has blessed us with a, with a wonderful place here. We're a little warm today, but that's okay. God has brought us together not to worry about how we feel, but more about what we're here for, and that's to celebrate Him, to worship Him, to be in His presence corporately because we're, we're the church. Each one of you is the church. So therefore, you're in His presence daily. But when you come together, it's that corporate worship. And He receives that a sweet-smelling aroma to Him as we worship Him. But then to wrap your arms around your brother or your sister, to know someone's hurting, to know that there may be things in their life that they just need somebody to stand with them on. That's why we come together. That's the purpose of the church. To love your Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and that love one another as yourself. That's who we are. That's who we are in Christ. So I encourage you, make that your resolution this year, that you spend more time with Jesus, more of Him, less of yourselves, and let that take you wherever He wants you to go. Because I promise you, if there's something in your life, in the physical realm and material realm that He needs to deal with, when you're closer to Him, He's going to give you the strength to do it and to stay on task to do it because you're doing it through Him, not in your own strength. Because nothing in our own strength ever lasts. We're not designed to carry the burden of life. We're designed to give that to Jesus, for His, His burden is light. And so we give it to Him, we walk in Him, and we take this next year with that attitude of humility, that attitude of submission, and see what He does in your life this next year. See how He takes you. See how He grows you. See how He pulls you together. And you'll find yourself moving, growing, and doing exactly He's called you to do. And then the other thing I want to leave you in this point as well, and we've talked about this before, don't look at one another's gifts and talents and compare yourself to anyone else. If I were to do that as a pastor, I would quit. Because there's so many pastors that are so much better at doing what they do than I am. And I understand that. I do this because God said do it. And I pray that He will use me accordingly as He sees fit. But in all pastors and all teachers and all administrators and all gifts of healing and all talents and whatever it is that He's given you to do, do it in full diligence in relationship with Him that it's effective and it's ministry that moves and grows in your life and in other people's lives. And that's going to be the difference. So no comparison yourself to anybody else. Compare yourself to Jesus. Because when you compare yourself to Jesus, you very realistically see how shortcoming or how many shortcomings we have 
and we very easily then can submit ourselves back to him and say, God, not my will, but your will be done in my life, that I may be an effective child of yours to do and go as you see fit. That's God's plan. That's God's will for each one of us. Amen? Amen. Father, we ask that this word would be, again, written in our heart, that you would pour into our lives all that we need, that you would, Lord, that your spirit would come alive in us and that your word would come alive in us, the living word, the living word of God that cuts to the core, cuts to the bone into the joint, cuts to the marrow. It reveals that flesh and then it removes it. The great physician, the great surgeon who removes that sin and then carefully sews us back up, Lord, and heals us and brings us closer into the relationship of God. We thank you for that. We thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for all that you're doing. And we thank you, Lord, that your word is what sustains us. May you go with us and go before us in all that we do. We submit ourselves unto you. And may you bless each one here. Keep them, protect them, and guard them. And keep them in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.